All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are live. Let's make sure we are good to go here. All right, y'all. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Welcome in. Welcome back. It has been a little while, I know. Come on in as always. As you're coming in, let me know where you're listening in from. This is Core Christian Church. I know it's been a while. Y'all are like, where have you been? I have been around the world. We have been traveling. God has been so gracious. He's been so beautifully, wonderfully faithful. And I'm glad to be back with you guys. I know it's been a while, but you know what happens when I've traveled? I've come back with my belly full with a word for you all. So come on in. Let me know where you're listening in from. In case you don't know what's happening here on this morning, it is Core Christian Church. We are an apostolic, prophetic, global ministry, and we are here to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to bring us back to the core of Christ. God bless you, Glasgow. I see you. Welcome in, Georgia. Come on in. God bless you. I'm so excited to be with you all here on this morning. Come on in, Florida. I see you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Come on in. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to release this word that God has given to me for you all. It's about to bless you. I see you, son. Hey, Columbia, South Carolina. Good morning. Good morning, Kenya. Welcome in. Thank you so much, Pastor Michelle. I see you. Good morning. Good morning. Come on in, y'all. All right, y'all. So as always, grab something to write with, something to write on. Grab your favorite healthy beverage, get comfortable. This is a prophetic word that the Lord has released to me that I'm giving to you. Manchester, uh, United Kingdom, God bless you. Welcome in. Oh, I'm so happy to be back. Thank you so much for that. Hello, Dallas. God bless you. God bless you. Come on in. God has given me a word. And let me just, let me preface this just a bit because when he released it to me, I had to repent and repent. In the most beautiful way, if we know anything about repentance, if you all have been with me for a little while, you know that we don't look at repentance as a cuss word. <laughs> we don't look at it as condemnation. Repentance is a gift of grace. God gives us the grace to be able to repent so that we can get back in right standing for the assignment that he's given to us. God bless you, Melbourne, Australia. So glad to have you in the house on this morning. So when I say grab something to write with something to write on because this is a prophetic word for your life it's literally for where you are today it is a current word to help propel you for where god is bringing to you or bringing you to next amen all right god bless you i look extra radiant this morning amen <laughs> that that's what rest will do to you if you guys have not noticed look i'm gonna pin that thank you so much um, i'm a creature of habit i wear the same exact makeup style if i do it it's the same exact makeup style every single time. I wear the same colors until I run out. So God bless you and God bless the radiance. It is rest. It is Jesus. Amen. So thank you for that. All right. You guys have grabbed something to write with, something to write on. I'm going to kick off these holy shoes because we are in this holy place. Amen. Amen. I'm going to open us up in some prayer. I'm going to open us up in prayer. And then I'm going to release this word that God has given to me to give to you for where you are today. We're going to dig in. There's so much meat that God has given to me. So prayerfully, we can get through all of it. If not, we're going to turn it into a series. You know how we do. And we're just going to let the Lord flow as he does. So let's go ahead and pray. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to come back to your presence, come into your presence at the throne of grace just one more time, Father God. Lord, we don't take it for granted the opportunity that you've given to us to seek your face, to speak to you, God, to be able to hear from you, to be able to have this opportunity to even come to you with prayers and supplications, oh God, because we know that there are some people that did not have this opportunity to come back one more time. God, there are some people who did not wake up this morning. There are some people who don't know you on this morning. There are some people who left this earth without ever knowing you for themselves. And God, they have to spend an eternity without you. God, we are here seeking your face. We are seeking connectivity. God, we are seeking seeking relationship with you, Father God, through the Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may know you for ourselves. God, remove everything within us that is a hindrance, that is a blockage, that is stopping us from coming into the full knowledge of who you are, God, because we do not want to be perished. God, we do not want to fall by the wayside. We do not want to spend a life without you. So God, I pray on this morning that you just begin to open up the eyes and the ears of your children to hear and to see the things of you, Father God, the things in the realm of the 
spirit. God, we are declaring that this is a prophetic move that is here happening here. Every time that we gather, we declare, oh God, that your will will be done in and through us at every point and every chance that we get, God. Lord, I just thank you so much that what you're doing in us is that you're shifting us, you're changing us, you're healing us, oh God, you're growing us, you are maturing us. Father God, the person who we woke up as this morning is not the person that can go into our next. God, you're bringing us to a level of elevation. You're bringing us into a level of more power, dominion, and authority. God, you're giving us greater revelation. You're giving us a greater knowledge, Father. And I thank you that you're shifting us because the next level requires a new us, God. God, it requires a new mindset. It requires a new language. It requires a new knowledge, oh God. And I just thank you so much that that is what's going to happen here on today. Lord, you are in the midst because you are so wonderful. You're so faithful. You so, you're so grateful, God. And I thank you that you are a covenant keeping God. Lord, I thank you that the covenants that you have poured out to your children are still yes and amen. God, the desires of the hearts that are inside your children are the desires that you've given to them. And I declare that they're going to come to pass. God, I declare even now, God, that every distraction, every demon, every hindrance, every delay that would seek to stop your children from gaining what it is that you have for them in this level and the next God is coming under subjection even now. God, every demon must bow. Every emotion must bow. Every lie must bow. God, every uh, everything that they're up against, every battle must bow. Every devil must bow. God, I declare now every principality, every authority, every power, every spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. God, I declare now it is bowing to the name of Jesus Christ. And because we have the same spirit that Jesus Christ had, God, it must bow to the word that your children speak. I thank you, God, for the authority that you've given to them to declare life over themselves and death to the enemy. I thank you, oh God, now that they are strengthened in their spirit. They're strengthened in their mind. They're strengthened in their hearts, oh God, to keep going in the things of God, the assignment that you've given to them. Lord, I know that there's no blueprint. God, I know that there is no one else doing it like them. Father, I even know that there's some people who are waiting on somebody else to do it first, somebody else to show them. I even see and hear in the realm of the spirit, some people that are waiting on God. And this is why God said this to me earlier. I kept hearing God say, he's waiting on you. And not that he's waiting on me, but he's waiting on his children. So often we think that we're waiting on a word from God. And God says, no, I'm waiting on your obedience. I'm waiting on you to move. I'm waiting on you to trust me and to step forward. Even though you don't see the entire staircase, you see the step before you. And I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on you to, to trust me, to step forward. Father, I bless your name that what you are already doing in this place. You're breaking yokes. You're destroying chains. <laughs> you're, you're breaking chains off of your children, off of their minds, off of their spirits. God, you're giving them a fresh wind. I just saw in the realm of the spirit, a fresh oil. Father, I thank you that there's a fresh oil that's being poured out to your children, a fresh wind that's being lifted there's a wind that's being lifted up under your wings. If we think about a bird, an eagle, as it soars, what, it, what it's dependent upon is the wind beneath its wings to carry it from one destination to the next. Even through the aerodynamics of the wings, creating the wind necessary for travel. You can no longer stay in this place. You've outgrown this place. <laughs> This place was good for the past season. This place was good for where you were. My God. But it's time to go from this place. You haven't even realized. I keep seeing, and I know this is in part because of what I'm going to speak on today, but I keep seeing a nest. I'm going to speak about the eagle here on today, but I keep seeing a nest and you carry the spirit of the eagle, the children of God. We know that the, the eagle is, is representative of, of God. And I keep seeing that you, as you have carried the spirit of God, you are literally outgrown. You have outgrown the nest. You, you have overcome the nest. Your, your wings are hanging over the side. Your, your leg is kind of poking out the back. You have outgrown this place that you're in currently. 
It's time to get up and go to the next. Somebody has gotten very comfortable in this place. You've gotten comfortable with these thought processes. You've gotten comfortable with the, these battles. You've gotten comfortable with this lifestyle. You've gotten comfortable with the things that you can expect every day. You no longer expect the unexpected and you're okay with that. You've become comfortable. You have become complacent. But the word of God says that Paul instructed to be content not complacent. And some of us have become complacent. And I'm seeing you in the realm of the spirit. You have literally outgrown the nest, the place that you've made your bed, the place that you've made your home. Spiritually speaking, for some, it is physical. I'm hearing God say, you've got to get it from this place. You no longer fit. You no longer fit here. It's because God didn't call you to shrink. He didn't call you to be small. He didn't call you to, to fall in line with those things and, and, and what society says is normal. Normality and mediocrity is not your portion. In the name of Jesus, you got to get up and go. You've got to get up in the realm of the spirit. Stop battling with the what ifs. Stop battling with the if. The, the extra thought processes and, and, and the battles of the mind, stop battling. Let me tell you something that I do. The moment that a battle begins to be so overwhelming and heavy in the mind, or I just notice it, I open up the word of God. Start going down a rabbit hole. I always say, get your notes Bible, your notes Bible. It's an annotated reference Bible if we're going to be exact. Get you an annotated reference Bible, amen? And just begin to read the notes. And as you're reading the notes, Go down the rabbit hole. Before long, you will find yourself in a completely different mind space. This is why the word says to study the word, to show yourself approved. It's not to show yourself approved by man. No, 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 no. You have to show yourself approved to God the Father. Show yourself approved in your mindset. Show yourself to prove in your spirit. If you are a spirit being made in the image of God, then you ought to feed it its original sustenance and substance, which is the word of God. Somebody needs to get out from this place. Father, I thank you for what it is that you're about to do, what it is that you're already doing, God. I thank you for the lives that are about to change, that have already changed, that have already shifted. God, there's something that you want to do so miraculous in this place. So miraculous the shifting, the changing, the birthing. God, I thank you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen and amen. Glory to God. I saw a few people that said, that's me, that's me, that's for me. And I bless God that even in the opening prayer <laughs> that you could receive the word that God needs to get to you so often God is trying to get something to you. And the enemy knows that if he can distract you, he knows that if he can delay you in your mind and your spirit, if he can get you to second guess and doubt what it is that God is doing, then he's one. We scream and we preach and we sing and we worship that he's a defeated foe, that he's under our feet. Y'all remember that song from Sunday school? But let me tell you, there is a place that the enemy can win. He can have victory on the battlefield of the mind, only if he can convince you to hand it over. But I declare right now in the realm of the spirit by the power and the authority that we have through the son, Jesus Christ, that every victory that was handed over, whether it's through ignorance, whether it's through stress, whether it's through frustration and anxiety, whatever it is, is being returned back to the children of God in the name of Jesus. I declare that you are taking back your victory. I declare that you are taking back your breakthrough. I declare that you're taking back your win. You're taking it back. You're taking back your mind. You're taking back your strength. Take it back. Remember how I preached this and I'm standing on this. I preached this on New Year's Eve that this was the year of all. We're getting everything back. We're taking it all of it back. We're going to have all of what God has for us. Every single promise, all of it is yes and amen. The power that you have over the enemy, the word of God has said that you have power over all of the enemy. So I declare that you're taking it back. 
I declare that you're taking back everything that belongs to you, everything that the enemy stole, everything that you gave over to the enemy, everything that he lying and deceitfully convinced you to hand over to him. I declare by the power of Jesus Christ, you're taking it back now. Take back your marriage, take back your children, take back your finances, take back your health, take back your joy, take back your peace, take it back, y'all. All of it belongs to you. He's a thief. He's a liar. He is not worthy. Take it back because it's yours. In the name of Jesus, it is yours. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. Look, as I was just going through life, minding my business, I began to watch this video. If there's something, one thing you'll learn about me is that I, and I've learned this about my nephew as well, we love science. We love animals. <laughs> we love the nature that God has created. And I was watching this video about this eagle. And this eagle, the eagle has been so highlighted to me over these past few weeks, maybe over a month at this point. God has been highlighting the eagle. And we know that the eagle is, a, again, a representation of God. And he's been highlighting the eagle. So when I saw this eagle, I was intrigued, of course. And I see this eagle sitting on its nest and it's sitting over its eggs. It's, it's keeping the eggs warm. And throughout the video, you see, because you know how in America, anyways, the bald eagle is our um, our national bird and they keep uh, these cameras over like all of their nests. It's very interesting. Uh, but this eagle, the mother eagle is in the nest. And as it fast forward, as the camera fast forwards, you see that it sits there through snow, through rain, through ice, through cold, through night, through day. The eagle does not move. You'll see the father eagle come every so often to try to push her out of the nest so that she can go eat. The, the moderator was telling us how there are, there are times where she would go days without eating because her assignment was to sit on the egg and sit on what was her promise, to sit on what was the fruitfulness, to sit on what was the multiplication that was promised to her, to sit on and steward over what God has given to her to birth into the earth realm. Woo. She had the assignment to sit on the egg, to cultivate it, to keep it warm, to ensure that she's doing what she needs to do to make sure that not only do these things stay safe and warm, but they become birthed in the earth realm. Now, what I've learned about eagle eggs is that it takes roughly 35 days for them to hatch. If they don't hatch by day 39, there's a very, very, very small percentage, less than 1% that it's actually going to hatch. These things, these babies, will not hatch if they don't hatch by day 39. On day 40, mom is still sitting on the eggs and they have not yet hatched. How many of us have been sitting on something, cultivating it, grooming it, growing it, working on it, investing in it, putting time, energy, talents into it, and it still hasn't birthed. It still hasn't come to fruition. The promises of God don't quite look like the yes and amen. And, and it didn't quite look like what God said it was going to. God spoke something to you. He spoke a word. There's a prophetic word that God has given over your life. And it's not looking like the promises of God because you're on day 39. Maybe even you're on day 40. And whether that's 40 days, 40 weeks, or 40 years, you're sitting there and you're like, God, this doesn't look like the promise. You told me that this was going to be birthed into the earth realm. Some of you have been called to be speakers. Some of you have been called to be coaches, business owners, and entrepreneurs. You've been called to be pastors, apostles, and prophets. You've been called to be worship leaders. You've been called to be kingdom financers. You've been called to do the work of the Lord, but somehow, some way, it's not coming to pass in the way that you thought it was. You have been enduring the storms. You have been enduring the cold. You have been enduring being isolated and alone. The fight and the struggle has been real. 
You have sat in that place. You have believed God. You have come up against the naysayers. You've been coming against the soothsayers. You've been coming against the demons and the witches and the warlocks. You have come up against some battles for what you were believing God for. And your faith, if we may be honest, has begun to waver and to dwindle just a bit. It's day 40 and, and according to the world, you should have been did the thing, right? Oh, girl, you should have been married and oh, you should have been had a baby and uh, you should have been launched that business and you should have been been a millionaire and you should you should have done all the things according to society. You were supposed to give birth to that thing a while ago. Somebody told you you're behind schedule. Somebody's trying to convince you that, you know what? It probably isn't going to happen. There are some eagles who, in fact, don't give birth. The, 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 the eggs don't actually hatch. And, and studies have shown that they do mourn and they do grieve, which is so interesting. And so because it happened to somebody else, now they're like, yeah, you probably, your eggs probably won't hatch. It probably won't be birthed into the earth realm. Or if it is birth, it's probably going to look, you know. <laughs> but let me tell you something about this day 40. Ooh, let me tell you about this day 40. As I was studying 40 days, we see the number 40 so often in the Bible. Jesus fasted for 40 days. There's actually a couple of people that fasted for 40 days. We know that the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, we know that it was uh, Jonah who preached to the Ninevites for 40 days. Uh, we know that there was the 40 day uh, flood with Noah, 40 days and 40 nights. And we know that Goliath taunted, taunted the Israelites for 40 days. Let's focus on Goliath for just a moment. You have been taunted, whether it be in the mind, in the spirit, in your own thought processes for 40 days. Everybody's telling you, you probably should just give in, probably should just give up, you probably should just release that. It's probably not going to be birthed. There's probably not going to be fruitfulness. I don't know if you should do that business. It's not looking like what it should. It's been X amount of time, 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath taunted them, taunted them. Where's your warrior? I thought y'all was big, bad, and, and all that for 40 days. Hmm. Let's open up our Bibles because there's something about that number 41. If you can just hold on today, 41, if you can hold out for 41, there's something that happens at 41. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, the first Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17, we are going to start. We can start at verse 12, just so you have some context. I'm going to read all the way through, so stick with me. I'm reading from the New King James Version. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 12, and I'm going to read through verse 51. Y'all got that? First Samuel, good morning. Thank you so much. New King James Version. Where are we? All right. Verse 12. The Bible says, now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn next to him, Abin Abinadab, excuse me, and the third Shama. David was the youngest. And the three oldest followed Saul. Now let's just position this. David is the youngest. Think about your youngest child, your youngest sibling. If you're the youngest, more than likely, we think the youngest is not qualified. Okay. Verse 15, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and night. Goliath was a Philistine. He was a giant Studies believe that it was the fallen angels that mated with the women that created these giants. 
So not only is David a giant, he is what half angelic? Yes. <laughs> David taunting them, presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Y'all been in this battle for a long time. Verse 17, then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. David was on assignment to serve. Somebody write that down in your notes. David was on assignment to serve. Before he could have victory, before he could birth into the earth realm, what God had already put on the inside of him in the spiritual realm, he first served. Verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Ella fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight to the fight and shouting for the battle for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. He spoke the same language. Ooh, that's good. Listen, listen, let me pause, let me pause right there. Let me pause right there. The enemy of David spoke his language. He could understand what they were saying. Some of us got to change our language because the language that we're speaking can be understood by the enemy. When we're speaking defeat, when we're speaking neg negativity, when we're speaking fear and doubt, it's a language. The enemy understands fear. He understands doubt. He understands defeat. So when he begin to speak like this, the enemy's like, oh, oh, I, oh, I know this language. Oh, I understand this. And he begins to approach you. He can have conversation with you because he speaks that same language. But if you would just shift your language, somebody write that down in your notes. I need to shift my language. Begin to speak the language of the heavenly. See, a lot of times when we preach, even as preachers, we'll say speak in your heavenly language. You begin to speak in tongue. But what if you can't speak in tongue? The Bible says not everybody will have the gift of tongue. So then if you are speaking in your heavenly language, it's going to sound something like, God, you are a covenant keeping God. God, you are faithful. Lord, I am more than a conqueror. I am victorious because your word says so. That's your heavenly language. Somebody say, change my language. Going back into the word. In verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? The reproach. Come on here. For who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let, let me let me break this down into our language. David said, y'all worried about that little that little irritation right there. Uh, who who is this devil? Who is this demon? Who is this person that would come up and, and, and defy God, the father, the almighty God, Elohim, Adonai? Wait a minute. Who who is this that has your ear? Let me talk to you directly real quick. Who has your ear right now? Who has your heart in this season? Who has your, con come on here. Who is this that has the power and the authority to sway you to where you start thinking of doubt? You start second guessing yourself, self-consciousness. You start to worship comparison and fear and worry. Who, who is this that would defy my God? Who, who? Okay. All right. All right. Let's, let's, let's see if we get some answers here. Mm, mm, mm. 
I'm going to read that question again. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this ungodly person that he should defy the armies of the living God? Come on, living God. We don't serve a, a dead God. We don't serve a statue. We don't serve an altar. We don't serve an idol. We serve a living God. And who is it that would have the, the, the guts to come and defy what God has put on the inside of you? Who is it that would defy the promise, the stamp that he put on you? Who is this that would defy the living God? Verse 27, and the people answered him in this manner. They always got something to say saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Okay. Verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. Some people are not going to like when you walk in your godliness. When you begin to walk in the deity that God has placed on the inside of you, some people are not going to like you, including some family. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? <laughs> then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard and they reported them to Saul and he sent for him, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth. Saul said, you can't do it. He said, let me let me tell you why, because logically speaking, you're not able to go against Goliath to fight with him. Why? Because you're too young. You're inexperienced. You haven't done this before. I've never seen it. Done. You you cannot do that. You're not qualified. And the person that you're up against, well, he's a man of war from his youth. Oh, he's not new to this. He's true to this. What you're up against, the devil himself, his, his principalities, his generals, you're up against something that was birthed for war and destruction. And, and you're young. So you, you can't do this. This is what Saul said to him. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Let me pause right there. There are some of y'all who have gone through some private battles, okay? You have gone through some warfare that nobody knows about. On the outside, you look like you've got it all together. On the outside, you may look youthful like you haven't gone through some stuff. Ooh, we thank God we don't look like what we've been through. There are some of us who have gone through some things in the dark, in the deep of the night that nobody would ever know. Fighting literally for your life. You have fought spiritually lions. You have fought spiritually bears. You have killed them. And in that same boldness, in that same confidence, this Philistine is going to be just like one of the battles that you already won. And it's because you, the reason why you won is because you serve a living God. Not a dead God, not, not a statue, not somebody so far away, a, a living God that lives on the inside of you. Just because you don't look like what you've gone through, just because they don't know what you've had to prevail through, what you had to war through, and what you've won against, they don't know. And so you look like you've never gone through some stuff, and we bless God for that. But he knows, you know what you've gone through. And it's because of that. And because you serve the living God that you will kill this uncircumcised Philistine like one of them. Come on, like one of them. Seeing that he has come up against, not that they are coming up against you. They're coming up against the God within you. They're coming up against the assignment of God he's given to you. They're coming up against the assignment that God is trusting you with. It's because of the God in you that you're up against this war. 
But David had so much trust. Oh, it's not, you're not coming up against me. Oh, you, you coming up against him. Continuing on, verse 37, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he would deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. He didn't believe him. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. You don't need man's approval. Look, let, let me, let me free somebody right here. That spirit of, of, of the judgment, the fear of judgment of other people, the spirit of the opinion of other people, the, the people pleasing spirit, we rebuke it. We bind it up and send it back to the pits of hell right now in the name of Jesus. Look what Saul said, go and the Lord be with you. David didn't care. We don't care. <laughs> we don't care. I don't care. We don't care what they have to say because we know that the living God is with us. Verse 38. So Saul clothed David in his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. He tried to put on somebody else's armor that he had never walked with. They're trying to tell you, you should probably do this and you should do it like that. And, you know, there's a time where but you hadn't tested it to see if that's the right weapon of your warfare. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. When David takes those things off, y'all, that's taking off somebody else's armor, somebody else's tactic, somebody else's blueprint, somebody else's way. That looks like defeating the spirit of comparison. When God is calling you to do it like this, but everybody else is doing it like that, that's all right. Do it like this, because that's not your armor. This is verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Verse 41. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. You don't look like what you've been through. And so they don't think that you can. What you're fighting up against is judging you. There's no way. How can you? Do you see how you talk? Do you see what you look like? Do you see? I mean, if we break down this scripture, the Philistine Goliath looked at his age. He looked at his appearance. He looked at how he carried himself. The shepherd's boy. Okay. <laughs> Verse 43. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Now he's taunting him. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Y'all, y'all, y'all keep calling on those idols if you like. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Goliath is trying to get in his head. We are on day 41, okay? And Goliath is trying to get into his head the way that he's done everybody else. He said, oh, come, come over here. I got something for you. I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Begin to think about what it is that the enemy says to you. Oh, when you get up there, I'm going to make sure that nobody receives you. I'm going to make sure that they laugh at you. I'm going to make sure that this, that, and the third, he's going to feed your flesh to the birds and to the beasts of, of the field. He's trying to get in your head. Because again, the only place that the enemy can ever win is on the battlefield of the mind. He won. The Goliath was winning for 40 days up against the Israelites. Then he came on day 41 to David. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give you the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Look, he literally took exactly what the enemy said to him and said the same exact insult to him, but not for my glory, not for my vengeance, not for my avenging, but because of God the Father. Y'all, when you walk in the purpose of God, when you do it for the kingdom, 
Y'all remember that saying back in a couple years ago that got real popular, do it for the culture, do it for the vine, do it for the kingdom. When God's name is on something, y'all, it has no choice but to come to pass. It has no choice but to be birthed. It has no choice but to be powerful. It has no choice but to show itself great and mighty here in the earth realm because his name is on it. So when somebody comes up against you, recognize and realize it's not coming up against you. It's coming up against God. And because it came up against the living God, it's going to come to pass. And that very thing that the enemy meant for evil up against you, who is the very thing. Y'all remember Mordecai. Mordecai, he went, if you don't know, Mordecai was um, Esther's cousin. And Esther, Queen Esther, who was the Jew who ended up marrying the king. And it was her positioning as the queen that allowed her to save the people when there was a, we'll call it a coup to kill all the Jews. Mordecai had found out about this coup to kill all of the Jews. He went to his cousin, please, you got to do something. She's like, I can't do anything. I'm going to die. He was like, you got to figure out something because they're going to kill all the Jews. The person who was set out to kill all the Jews created this big, oh, what is it called? The gallow when they're going to hang somebody and try to chop off their head. It was a whole device to kill Mordecai. When the king ended up finding out the truth behind the situation, the very thing that was designed, handmade to kill Mordecai was the very thing utilized to kill the man who wanted to kill Mordecai. The same exact thing that the enemy wants to use to take you out is the same thing that's going to take him out. It is the same thing that's going to give you the victory over the enemy. Do not be afraid. The enemy is literally setting up the snares and the traps for himself. The word of God says that I believe in the book of Psalms, that the very things that the enemy has set up, the enemy, those people coming up against you will fall in the same trap themselves. And it's not the people that are coming up against you. It's the spirits. We don't fight people. We fight spirits. Let's continue on in the word. Verse 47, then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. He doesn't need a sword. He doesn't need a spear. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, my God. And he fell on his face to the earth. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Remember, he made the threat. The same thing he was going to do to me, I'm going to do to you. But he didn't have a sword. So therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his own sword <laughs> and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And with and when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Welcome to day 41. Day 41 is the day that there is victory if you just hold on. If we look at if we look at the different things that happened on day or year 41. So if we go back as I was looking for 40 years, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. On 41 came a new generation to enter into the promised land. For 40 days, we just saw that Goliath taunted, taunted the Israelites. 40 days on day 41, David came and he prevailed against this thing. It was for 40 days that Jonah delivered the message to the Ninevites to repent. They did not listen for 40 days. For On day 41, they repented and God gave grace and mercy upon them. Jesus fasted in the desert, was tempted by the enemy, was taunted for 40 days on 41. Come on. On day 41, his monumental ministry began a victory of conquering over all of the enemy. Day 41. So we see here that it is on day 41, if you remain postured in position, if you do what it is that God has called you to do, if you press past, if you hold on to hope, if you tr trust and believe God, if you stay in your word, if you cut off the distractions and the delay on day 41, 
There is victory concerning your life. There's victory concerning the assignment. There is victory concerning what the Lord has spoken. There is birthing in the earth realm what God has already ordained and promised in the realm of the spirit, day 41. You got to hold on to day 41. You got to hold on to day 41. There was a word that the Lord spoke to me. I'm going to release this and then we're going to go. God began to deal with me about what true worship looks like. True worship. When we worship God, oftentimes we think that it is a praise, it is a shout, it is a sing, it is a clapping of our hands. We're praising God. We're worshiping him. But the word of God says to worship in spirit and in truth. For worship in this season, worship is walking in full obedience of who God has called you to be and the assignment that he's given to you today. Today. Oftentimes, especially in the westernized societies, we tend to focus on what's next. What's the plan? What's the blueprint? What's the next step? How do we know what to do? But God said, are you obedient today? Are you following what I told you to do today? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's not here yet. It'll take care of itself. Are you in obedience today? And so what God began to show me was this struggle that I had with the spirit of comparison caused me to not walk in the fullness, the boldness, the authority of who God has called me to be. Comparing, well, they I don't preach like that and I don't hoop like that and I don't shout like that and I can't dance like that. And, and so I'm focused on all of the other things. We're focused on what they're saying. We're focused on what they're talking about. We're focused on what they said it should be and how it should be. We're focused on all the other things. But God says when you're not focused on them or when you're focused on them and not focused on me, you're not worshiping me. You're worshiping them. You're worshiping doubt. You're worshiping fear. You're worshiping second guessing. You're worshiping all these other things. I called you to worship me. And when you worship God, that looks like obedience. That looks like being who God has called you to be with your voice, with your stature, with your posture, with your revelation of the word, with your tactic and your blueprint, with what the weapons that God has given to you, with your trust. That's how we worship him in spirit and in truth. I had to repent. I had to repent. Are we worshiping God in fullness? Are we trusting God for day 41 or are we struggling at day 40? And so what God began to show me in the realm of the spirit was me standing there. I was looking at another version of me in the realm of the spirit and my face was completely wrinkled and drooping. And I'm looking at why do I look so old and why do I look why do I look like this and so I'm just watching and there was a fountain it was as if we were in biblical times somewhere in Jerusalem or Israel and there was a fountain and God said to step into the fountain and as I stepped into the fountain I completely submerged myself I didn't know what was happening but God said he was stirring the waters I heard God say he's stirring the waters and so in the realm of the spirit, I stepped into this fountain. I completely dunked myself. I'm fully submerged in it, cover me completely. And when I arose back out of the water, I was completely youthful. I was completely glowing. And I asked God, what is this? And he handed me, so y'all receive this in the realm of the spirit, new garments and, and new sandals. And as I stepped out and I dressed in my new garments and my new sandals, he said, as you were not worshiping me, you became stagnant. And in the stagnation, you grew old and you were getting ready to die at that place. Stagnation causes death in the realm of the spirit. And I am here to save your life. You've, gone, you, you've grown stagnant. In comparison, you've grown stagnant in fear. You've grown stagnant in doubt. You've grown stagnant in worry. You've grown stagnant in the things that are not of God. And what I saw in the realm of the spirit is that as you remain stagnant, there is death that is coming upon you. It is an untimely death. It is a premature death. It is a spiritual death. But if you would just step into, whew, step into this fountain where the waters are being stirred where the spirit of God is, 
so that he can wash you over from head to toe, where he can give you your new garments, where he can give you your new sandals, and where he's telling you to go in the fullness of who I've called you to be, in the way that I've called for you to do it. I don't need two of whoever you're looking at. I don't need another version of your pastor. I don't need another version of your covering. I need you. God has called you for such a time as this. Think about that. Think about the entire spectrum of the continuum of space and time. And God said, I need her here. I need him here. Specifically for such a time as this. You are needed to walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be authentically, boldly. I don't need you. I hear God say, I don't need you to be like them. I don't need you to talk like them. I don't need you to do it the way that they did it. You can take the understanding from them. Yes, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to uh, uh, try to do the same thing twice. But when you take the, the, the power of the living God and you apply it to the assignment, Apply it to your mind. Apply it to what you've been called to do. What you will find is a lifestyle of day 41. What you will find is victory and prevailing at every turn. When you start to walk in, Lord, this isn't for my will. This isn't for my glory. This is for yours. But God is such a good God that he says in his word for his glory and for your good. It'll always work out for your good. Begin to think about the attacks, the things that are coming up against you. Understand and realize if everything is working out for my good, and this doesn't feel good, but the word of God is always true, then this too is good. You got to reverse engineer some stuff in your life at times. If this is an attack, but everything works out for my good, then this thing is good too. God is not a wasteful God. He's going to use everything in and around your life, every attack for your good. You always have two options. Y'all, I can't even begin to explain to you what happened to my car on this past weekend because I don't even really know. Something happened. <laughs> the curb jumped out at me. Okay, the, the curb attacked me. So much so that the car would no longer turn left and I had to get it towed. I said, wait a minute, Jesus. I was going 15 miles per hour. How, how, but you know what your word says? That all things is working out for my good. All things are working out for my good. Then that means that this is good too. Okay, tow it. Yes, go ahead. How much? Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. Because this is working out for my good. I don't care what it is. I don't care how it's set up in your life. I don't care what the Philistine is that you're dealing with. The Goliath, Goliath that you're dealing with, that's working out for your good. The attacks up against your mind, it's working out for your good. What the enemy's trying to do, it's working out for your good. What the doctors are saying, it's working out for your good. Understand that there are some things that are positioned in your life to birth the ministry that God has given to you. Birth the assignment that was given to you. Think about Jesus's first miracle and I'm done. Jesus's first miracle, and I'm gonna give credit, my cover and told this to me, Dr. Oscar, it blessed my whole soul. Jesus's first miracle was when he turned water into wine, right? Y'all remember that? Water into wine. Who announced that the water was turned into, into wine? Not a disciple, not a follower of Jesus, the DJ, the MC of the wedding. There are going to be unlikely people in your life those that you thought were up against you, people who are not Bible thumping, tongue speaking, believing, Jesus believing folks who are going to help to announce your ministry, announce your assignment. If you would stay rooted in the trust and obedience of God, worshiping him in spirit and in truth and holding on for day 41, because day 41 is here. In the name of Jesus, day 41 is here. I want y'all to declare in the chat, declare in the comments, welcome to day 41. Welcome to day 41. Welcome. Tell somebody, y'all, if we were in the house, I would tell y'all, go around, love on somebody, hug on somebody, tell them, welcome to day 41. I love you with the love of the Lord. Welcome to day 41. Welcome to day 41. To God be the glory. Welcome to day 41. You might need to tell yourself that. 
Welcome to day 41. It's been a long 40 days. It's been a long 40 years. It's been a long 40 weeks, but welcome. Welcome to day 41. There's power in that 41. Jesus experienced 41. Moses experienced 41. Goliath, <laughs> he, he lost on day 41. David experienced day 41. The Israelites experienced day 41. Jonah and the Ninevites experienced day 41. Welcome to day 41. Welcome to day 41. I thank you, God, for today, day 41. I thank you for the strengthening that is coming over your children to continue to press toward the mark, to walk in full obedience today. Father, we're not concerned with tomorrow. We're not worried about it. No, Lord, we know that we serve the Lord of hosts, the living God, and anything that would seek to defy us is defying you. And they will have to answer to that. They will bow to that. We will prevail against it. We have victory against it. We are more than conquerors because of you. Not by anything that we've done other than our obedience, but it's because of your grace, because of your power, because of your love. And so, Father, we stand rooted, strengthened, encouraged, excited about day 41. Breakthrough is here. And we bless your name it's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. And amen. I bless God for your day 41. I, I'm excited about what's to happen. You are called to walk in your fullness of your assignment, of your purpose, of your authority, of who God has called you to be in that way. In case you haven't noticed over this past year, I don't preach like other preachers. I don't sound like them. I don't dance like them. I don't hoop. And that's okay. Who has God called you to be? How has he called you to be that person? Do just that. As we're moving forward in the assignment that God has given to me that does not have a blueprint. As I'm preaching to y'all, y'all have to understand, I'll be preaching to myself too, okay? The Lord, he like, you go, you'll be the first partaker of this word. But as we're moving forward in what God has assigned us to do, y'all, we are launching a physical building. We are launching a physical building and we need you. If you are in Maryland, because we're building the local church and then we're going to be building out the global church, there's going to be global locations. There's going to be buildings all around the world. God has already given the vision. We're first going to build the local church here in Maryland. If you are in the great state of Maryland, we will be launching in Clinton, Maryland. There is a great harvest. God began to speak that there is a great harvest of souls necessary in Clinton, Maryland. And so if you are in Maryland and you would love to be a part of what we are building, we need hands on the ground. We need boots on the ground. We need leaders, people who will sow their time, talents, and treasures for the work of God. Please, 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 please send an email, send a DM. If you know somebody in the great state of Maryland who would be an amazing part of this assignment, please send them this way. If you're not local, but you're like, I want to help build and you can do something virtually. If there's an assignment that God is placing on your heart, we will take that as well because we are building without a blueprint. There are organizations that are help us to build and build well, but what God is telling us to do is so different. Um, as we are doing this process, I want you all to be the first to know as we're building out this process, there's going to be a winding back of our virtual services as God is telling us to build the, the local church. So you'll want to get in the leaders that are a part. We will still gather because we have to, we'll be building. Um, but you'll notice that the virtual services will start to be pulled back until we launch physically in the building. Um, so I want you guys to be aware of that. I'll give you more information as time goes, but I'm asking humbly. I'm asking full, full transparency. I cannot do this by myself. I can't build it by myself. I've already got an awesome team. Um, right now we are five strong. And I'd love to have a team of at least 10, 10 to 15 of people who have a heart sold out for God, for the kingdom. This is not about serving Cynthia. This is not about serving the, the woman of God. Um, this is about serving the vision that God has. Um, and we are bringing the body of Christ back to the core of Christ. That is the assignment. We are building communities. We're building families by changing lives, by getting back to the core of Christ. That is our mission. So if that is you, if the Lord has been pressing it upon your heart to be a leader, to be a sower, to be a, a laborer, a co-laborer with us, send me a DM, send the church a DM, send us an email. 
and let's do the work of the Lord. Otherwise, let's bless every seed, every seed that has come through. I bless God for all of the tithes that have come through, the tithes that come faithfully. We bless your name, God. Every seed that has been sown into this great good ground. I bless every seed. I did this already, but I'm going to bless the seeds that have come um, that have helped me to travel to London and back. That's where I was. I realized I didn't talk about the trip at all, uh, but that's okay. The Lord needs to do what he needs to do. It's not about me, um, but I was blessed to be able to go to London um, and spend some time under our covering um, and learn. Oh, it was powerful. I'm going to share the link. It was so powerful. Um, but I bless God for all of those seeds. And I already de have declared that the seeds are returning tenfold. The seeds are returning 100 fold in the name of Jesus to continue to do the work of the kingdom. Your household is a part of the kingdom. Your bills are a part of the kingdom. Your debt free time freedom and financial freedom is a part of the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. And I declare that the will of God is happening over your lives, over your families over your marriages, over the assignment that God has given to you because of your faithfulness and because of your obedience and because this is good ground. We have too many testimonies to prove it. We just bless God for that. And I thank God for your life. I thank God for all that he's doing. I speak now that an answer is being poured out for every prayer request, every desire, every prayer and supplication is being handled right now. You, you can seek God, uh, his voice for yourself to receive that answer. But I just see God handling every single prayer request as you sit at the feet of Jesus. So God, I bless you and I thank you in advance for everything. I thank you for every yes. I thank you for every no. I thank you for every not right now. We thank you, God. We love you. We honor you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things. Amen. And amen. You all have a blessed Sunday and I will see you on Wednesday. I love y'all with the love of the Lord. See you on Wednesday. God bless you all.